Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. Let's talk for a moment about the role that media coverage plays in the wake of stories such as the gang rape in Krugerstorp. A recent opinion piece by Media Monitoring Africa spoke of media coverage and the role it plays. The article stated how, how much of the media coverage on the horrific story centered around the nationality of the so-called Zamazamas and less on the actual crime of rape. And that the proceedings uh, police action focused largely on arrests of allegedly uh, of alleged illegal minors, none of whom we understand at least at this stage have yet been charged uh, with the Krugerstorp mass gang rape. For more on this issue, then I'm joined by Dr. Hebest Kasa from Women African Alliance, an NGO that works alongside national and women's organizations and mining impacted communities, exposing the impact of extractivism uh, on African women. Good evening, Dr. Kasa, and thank you for your time. I take it that you share these concerns that have been aired by Media Monitoring Africa about how South African news media has reported initially on the rapes uh, that happened in, uh, in West Village in Krugerstorp, but subsequently uh, on the community grievances around illegal mining and police actions around illegal mining, as well as issues of migration. Thank you for having me on your show, Thula Sizwe. Greetings to all your viewers. Johannesburg, it's important to remember that a woman contextualizes its work on the African continent with an understanding that there's an extractivist system of a model of development and that uh, if we look for a classic example would be Johannesburg. It's uh, essentially built on the labor of migrant workers uh, from the uh, southern African region and violence is inherent to the extractivist development model. This has never been a system based on consent. Uh, instead, it deploys brute force to dispossess smallholder producers, peasants, it super exploits mine workers, it destroys the environment on which working people and the peasants depend. Most importantly also, uh, there's, a, there's an understanding in African society, on an, and if you look at it from an African eco-feminist perspective, we talk of an understanding of harmony between humans and nature. This is a fundamental, uh, if you will, orientation that uh, African people have. But the advent of colonialism and capitalism is fundamentally violent in terms of this violent separation of humans from nature. Working women and their peasants in everyday lives to secure life and well-being of their families and communities, they carry a lot of unpaid labor that is not valued. And that process of uh, being undervalued within society Woman recognizes that sexual violence and gender-based violence is intensified in the extractive sector because of this degradation of women, this devaluation, the stripping of dignity. And uh, in, this, in this sense, woman also understands that there's a neoliberal model of extractivist development where vast majority of women are excluded and do not benefit economically. Uh, instead, corporate mining giants and their shareholders have been reaping super profits. So, Women artisanal miners are also an important group that we uh, are concerned about. And uh, women, they experience violence within artisanal mining, but also as a result of criminalization, also have to deal with police harassment. And we do agree with the perspective that, the, the, that, that has been put forward in terms of the very skewed reporting that we've seen. We do not see the women in the media reports so far. We do not understand the situation of the, the, the experience of, we don't have their experiences centered in the narrative. Instead, what we've had is essential, very narrow focus on the nationality of perpetrators, but no interest in the nationality of the women and their situation and what their trajectories were in life prior to the moment of violence so that we can understand them as human beings with dignity. Yeah. And, and in terms of your understanding, these power structures and systems that you describe, uh, the, the explo exploitation uh, and the inherent violence that you talk about in the extractive um, industries, it, 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 in terms of how it breeds violence within those communities, what we saw in Krugerstorp then, it, it, if I follow your, your argument, uh, is not an aberration from what you have observed elsewhere where you work uh, in terms of the work that you do as women. 
I mean, as women, we, we do have a focused work on the violence against women. And in fact, what we are confronted with uh, in other parts of the continent is with extreme violence. Yes, that is inherent in the extractive extractivist sector. And militarization is, for instance, one pattern that we've noticed. The ways in which communities that are mine host communities, essentially their human rights, their, even their, their, their citizenship, of society, as part of uh, a, a country or a society, as part of a polity, are essentially suspended. And uh, the violations that take place, because most of these communities in other parts of the continent tend to be located in remote areas. So the ability for people, for women especially, to seek justice in the moment when there's sexual violation or when there is femicide taking place, um, their ability to be able to draw that in is quite limited. So for instance, we, we have a number of uh, areas that we work in across the continent. In Zimbabwe, for instance, we work in Chiadzwa, Marange. Women is working with women who mm. faced violence and is actually doing the trauma and healing work with women. And part of a process of seeking justice. Now, if you think of Marange, you have to be thinking about diamond, uh, the mining. And in particular, in 2008, there was uh, essentially a massacre of 200 artisanal miners by the military. Uh, people living in Marange on a daily basis are subjected to surveillance and violations of their dignity, uh, with body searches constantly yeah. being taken by, uh, being uh, done on women especially. Um, and about $15 billion uh, said to have reported to have been looted out of Marange. Uh, residents of mining areas also get shot by private security when they cross concessions. And this is not something unique uh, in, in Zimbabwe, but it's across the right. board in, South, uh, in, in the African region. In Tanzania Just, also, yeah. similar body searches. Just in closing, Dr. Kasa, um, uh, what, what, would you re what would you suggest and recommend uh, for South African media then, confronted with having to report the initial crime uh, of rape, uh, the horrific gang rape, um, and at the same time then followed through by voices coming through from the community. How do you strike that balance that ensures that the story of these women that were raped and the story of the context in which the rapes occurred is not lost in the daily occurrences that, that, that sort of scream louder, let me put it that way, where, uh, where the communities are now marching and, you know, day in, day out, there's fire, there's burning, there's roads blockaded, there's helicopters. How do you not lose the original story and the nuanced context that you just painted? How do we balance that uh, in our storytelling and leading the conversation uh, in South Africa? I think the key issue is to be able to contextualize the context of insecurity that, co that communities living in areas that have been affected by mining have to contend with on a, day, on a daily basis. So what we have in this moment of crisis is a concentration of a problem, a problem that has preceded and has reached this crisis proportion. How can we understand that safety and security and well-being are all tied also to economic justice questions, also ecological justice questions? And we have to understand that the people who, the women who uh, unfortunately and tragically were, were horrifically raped uh, in that, in Krugerstock, we need to be able to understand that they, they were entering a space or, or entering a space that had been essentially also left in a situation of deep insecurity and violence, violence that the community was experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it also has to do with understanding the phenomenon of the Zama Zama, very complex issue in itself that also requires nuance. To be able to understand that there are many layers involved. You have the yeah. criminal syndicates that have the situation of, in, of insecurity also, but they operate because they've managed to flourish because there's a situation of uh, artisanal mining not being regulated in South Africa. It's important to listen to the National Association of Artisanal Miners when they talk about not identifying as Zama Zama, but rather as artisanal miners, as a valid form of a lively, livelihood strategy that they have had to turn to because of the high unemployment crisis. Yeah. Again, another uh, the, a situation of the kind of violence that people face on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. as they're trying to secure their livelihoods. And there are also narratives and perspectives of women artisanal miners. And that needs to also be centered in the conversation sure. about the experiences that they have also.
All right, I've got to thank you for your time and your insights there, Dr. Hibest Kasa from Women African Alliance. And not forgetting, of course, that I believe that in every bit of reporting that we do uh, on a daily basis, we should still be asking the questions of how far is the investigation? How far is the investigation into the rapes? We see all the activities that are happening. We see the fire. We see people burning each other's shacks and raiding homes, etc. Uh, police officials and the minister and everyone is there. But how far with the investigation? Can someone tell us at least that? How far is the investigation into the rapes that took place uh, in West Village in Krugerstorp about two weeks ago?